Um, we are so blessed here to have Alec Guerin from the Musqueam Nation with us. And I would love to offer um, Alec to do the welcoming for tonight. Alec, would you accept that? Uh, yeah, the CM, the CA, yeah. Alec Guerin, up, Tomaka, Konasqui, Tanitanat, Makwim, I eat in a quellowin, Quans e quatsnala, a meat at quit wheelum, eat an arch, what we are marched tamo, to show all mid tas, hunk meanum gun, e clue to show all across to squarmy, eat us a little bit of mustail, see a tallitson, aitra. My friends and relatives, um, my ancestral name is Tolnaka. My white name is Alec Garen. I uh, was just kind of going through the motions there. I started introducing myself by my English name because I just recently received my ancestral name. Um, yeah, it brings me good feelings to see you all today. Uh, and it's my uh, great uh, honor and privilege to welcome you on behalf of uh, my ancestors, my elders, and my people to the unceded territory of the Huntkaminum speaking people of Musqueam and acknowledging that some of BSB uh, also resides on territory claimed by our relatives from Squamish and Siliwotak. Hi, Trika. Alec, uh, thank you so much. I'd like to um, do a little reflection and I'd like to do this along with um, Leona Brown. Um, Leona Brown and I, um, tag team or we are the, the, the two people who are on the Indigenous Education Committee. And this past week, of course, with Leona running in the election, um, Leona could not attend the meeting. So I did attend um, for uh, on Leona's behalf. And at the meeting, um, it was raised of, you know, some special um, considerations, some special programs, for increasing uh, indigenous graduation rates. And I was so um, excited about the conversation there because that's the kind of form of reconciliation that provides for uh, better options for indigenous learners and to increase graduation rates is fantastic. And it also adds programming for other students for non-Indigenous students. So that's the kind of thing that everyone wins. And it's really important to reflect on, on empowering uh, special programs to increase Indigenous education as something that is not just for the Indigenous people, it's for non-Indigenous people as well. And it's a great way to have reconciliation take place. So I just wanted to reflect on, on, on a bit of what we'd work that was ongoing and that we do. Um, so thank you, Alec. And with that, we're going to open the meeting for PAC 101. So this is a special meeting. Uh, thank you, everyone, for coming. Um, we hope that we are able to, you know, give you a few lessons and a few of sharing of learning and then also do some of the unlearning and relearning that we need to all embrace as we're on that journey. And the journey that we're on is really about how do we improve our community and how do we improve our belonging for everyone. And if we do those two things, we drastically improve student outcomes. And that's what we're all about here is back to the kids. So that is gonna be our, our focus. We got a big slideshow, it's like 50 slides. We're gonna go through it kind of fast. And I'm also hot micing with Kayenta, yeah. so our vice chair. So Kayenta and I will kind of tag team it together and we have lots of guest speakers. So that's also a bonus. So Kayenta, just say a welcome and, and a bit of the flow and then we'll start the presentation. Sounds good. Um, yep, Vic and I went through the presentation earlier and just kind of looked at what we wanted to talk about and that we didn't want to necessarily read from the slides. Um, you'll notice that 
Um, they are fairly text heavy because there is so much information that we want to impart. Um, and so this presentation is not just for tonight, but to be kept on the DPAC website so that people can um, refer to it as needed over the course of their um, time in their school PAC. Um, and I'm doing this backwards. Now I'm going to introduce myself. <laughs> so I'm Kaya DeMartins, I'm the vice chair. Um, I have uh, a kid at Tai and a kid who's new to high school. So um, it's, it's interesting having a chance to see PACs uh, on both sort of levels of, of the of schools. Thank you, Kanta. So that's us, and we do want to know about all of you. So we'd love to go around the room and just have, you know, 15, 20, 30 seconds of each person just introducing themselves. It's worth to take the time to do that. Um, so let's start from my top uh, left, and that is Karen. Hello, I'm Karen. I have one kid left in high school, and he's in grade 10 at Tupper, and I'm the secretary of DPAC. Thank you. And then uh, Leona. Oh, hi, everybody. My name is Leona Brown. I am Gitsan and Nishka. Um, I, I don't sit on the pack yet because I'd rather just get straight to the point and be on the DPAC and um, the Indigenous Education Council. I'm great to be here. Thank you, Leona. Christy and then uh, Mad Madeline. Ayakui, Nekna Chetoe, Torshkur, Mate Umachok, Esi, Swalu, Mate Umachok, Pankupa Kichok, Ne Pichua, Swale, Awok, Andrew Lewis, Esi, Awok, Bree Peters, Ne Kucha, Swale, Awok, Vera Van Pelt, Esi, Awok, Christine John, Nep Set Choil, Awok, Bucky John, Ne Chek Quail, Vivian Lewis, Ne Rest Whale, Jerry Misconnect, the mate whale, halo mate misconnect, the mer whale, spanu misconnect. Uh, my name is Chetoaz, and my English name is Christy Pittman. I have um, two children at U Hill Elementary. Halo mate is in grade three, and spanu is in grade uh, kindergarten. Um, I'm Yurok, that's our territory behind us on my mom's side, and Shlatli on my dad's side. And I'm the DPAC rep for the U Hill. Christy, that's amazing. Thank you. <laughs> Hard one to follow, Madeline. Uh, uh, I used to go to U Hill. Hi, Christy. <laughs> um, I grew up in Vancouver, uh, so this is the place I know as home. My uh, all my relatives are from across the ocean. Um, I yeah, so the land of Musqueam, Tsleil-Waututh, and Squamish. Uh, I have one child. He is in grade one at General Wolf Elementary, uh, entering my second year of PAC involvement. Um, yeah, and I have gained a lot from coming to these meetings. Um, Karen Tang and uh, Nora. Hi, Nora. Like you guys have given lots of really invaluable help and Vic, you're brilliant. Everyone's really great. So I love, I love coming here and gathering information and bringing it back to our pack and um, implementing stuff. Thanks everyone. Oh, thank you. And uh, you mentioned Nora and Nora, you're next and you deserve a little bit of a special introduction because you reworked on some of our slides in our presentation and you did a tremendous amount of work. It's so appreciated. Thank you so much. Nora, please introduce yourself. Well, hi, Vic. Well, I'd really like to you know, thank everybody. And I, I really appreciate actually having the chance to, uh, to give some input. That's really, that's really actually what inclusive video is about to actually allow people to change stuff. So I'm really, really impressed by, by uh, the DPAC. It's, it's really good that um, you're so open and you're willing to you know, take in new ideas and um, let us share it together because we can all learn from each other. My, um, I'm the DPAC rep or one of them from Lord Bing this year. And um, I have two kids. One is in grade eight 
and the other in grade 10. And yeah, I'm, I'm really excited. And um, thank you so much, Vic, and thank you everyone else. Thank you. Oh, thank you, Nora. Uh, Christine and then Alicia. I am Christine and I'm the False Creek BPAC rep and new to being on a PAC. So interested to hear more about my role, um, both on the PAC at False Creek and the DPAC. And I have two kids. So I've got one who's in grade seven at Falls Creek, and then I have another one in grade 10 at Kitts High School. I'm happy to be here. And I'm Scottish, Irish, and Dutch background. <laughs> Thanks, Christine. Alicia. Hi, everyone. I'm Alicia Williams. I have two children. One is in grade seven at Osler, and the other is in grade 11 at Hamber. Um, my primary involvement with the DPAC has been with the Black and Indigenous Working Group, which uh, we'll get a chance to say a little bit about later. Uh, and this year, I am actually the DPAC rep for Osler. Thanks. And then Carrie, and then Amanda. Hey, everyone. Um, I'm Kerry. I'm the outgoing DPAC rep for Dickens. Um, actually, we do have somebody that's going to be joining the, the um, DPAC uh, get togethers um, next month going forward. But uh, I've joined the parent committee. And one of the things we want to do is an anti racism presentation um, to the student parent community. So um, I'm here um, in lieu of the new team. DPAC member. So I have two sons, they're both in Dickens, um, and I've lived in Vancouver for a good nine years, but originally from Scotland. Um, my dad is Indian, and my mum is half Scottish, half African American. So I'm a mixture of all that. Um, born and bred in Scotland, but now living here in Vancouver. So thanks for having me. Oh, great. Thank you for being here. Uh, Amanda. Hi, um, my youngest is now in grade 12 at Van Tech, where I am the DPAC rep, and that is my main hat when I'm here. Thanks, Amanda. Uh, Robin? Hi, let me turn my camera on. Um, hi, everybody. Nice to meet you. Um, I'll be the DPAC rep for Mackenzie. I have two kids, one in grade one and one in grade five. Um, and my secret motivation for being on DPAC is my kid in grade one is in a wheelchair. So I'm super interested in accessibility issues and learning more about how we can um, improve the school. So I'm kind of have two, two jobs. Well, thanks Robin. And um, uh, DPAC, um, the facilities committee, um, we'll talk about that just in a, a bullet point in our presentation, but uh, we're big on accessibility as well. So there's a lot, a lot of people that share that. Uh, okay, things have moved around a little bit. Sandra Bell and then Elise. Sandra, I know you're gonna leave your camera off. Hi, uh, yeah, sorry. Um, I'm Sandra. I have three children. Um, the oldest has already graduated back in 2020 from Windermere. Um, the youngest has autism. He's in a program at Templeton. And uh, the middle child is actually living in Maple Ridge, so in a different school district. I'm on the DPAC executive and I am the DPAC rep for Templeton. Thanks, Sandra. And Elise? And unmuted. Okay. <laughs> um, I am Elise and I can't seem to hang on a second and experiencing a bit of technical difficulty, but I am uh, the PAC treasurer for Sir Matthew Bigby PAC. Um, I have an 11 year old child in sixth grade and an eight year old child in third grade. So it just, um, we don't have a DPAC rep. So I just wanted to know more about the DPAC and how we can serve our community better. Thanks. Perfect. Well, welcome. Claire and then Kitty. Hello. I'm just going to keep my camera off. I didn't know I was going to be introducing myself. 
So no problem. anyway, um, <laughs> thanks. Um, I am the chair of the PAC at General Wolf Elementary. Um, it's my first year as chair and uh, Maddie, who you met before, encouraged us all to come and listen to this presentation. So I'm looking forward to learning about how we can run an effective uh, PAC this year. Um, so thanks very much. Oh, I have two kids, one in grade two and one in grade five, both at General Wolf. Well, thanks, Clara, for being here. Kitty and then Amber. I saw Kitty's microphone flash, but then it muted again. Okay, Amber? Hello, um, I'm Amber Srelio. I'm the DPAC committee rep for Selkirk Elementary. I have three children. My oldest uh, is Caden and he is in kindergarten this year. So my first opportunity to be on uh, a PAC. Thank you. Oh, perfect, welcome. And then Peter and then Naveen. Hi everyone, my name is Peter. Um, I have a grade seven son at Lord Tennyson Elementary and uh, I'm the new co-chair of the PAC and this is my first foray into PAC. So I'm hoping to learn something from all these wise people tonight. There'll be some good sharing here, Peter. Absolutely. Naveen, hi. Hi Vic. Yeah, my name is Naveen Gopal and uh... I have two kids at Henderson Elementary and, um, you know, myself, I actually went to, I've lived in Vancouver, the area my whole life, but it's kind of funny. I was talking to a, a PAC member about this uh, in, our, in our own PAC meeting that uh, I went to Mitchell School in Richmond. I went to uh, Blundell Elementary in, uh, in Richmond. I went to Queen Alexandra in East Vancouver. Uh, I went to Devon Gardens in North Delta. I went to Kennedy Trail in North Delta. Oh, and sorry, in Surrey. And then I graduated to junior high. I went to Ellen Matheson. And I then graduated from Queen Elizabeth in Surrey. Okay. And then I went to SFU. Yeah. I'm, I'm just glad to be here. And, um, and uh, yeah, I was look, kind of looking forward to this one to learn about kind of just how everything works. So thanks. Great. Thanks, Naveen. Uh, Divya and Navneet. Hi everyone, um, I'm Divya. I have two children. Uh, my younger one uh, goes to seventh grade and my elder one is at uh, 11th grade in Killarney. And uh, yeah, I am the PAC chair at Killarney. Thanks for this opportunity. Oh, you're more than welcome. Thank you for being here. Thank you. Uh, Navneet and then Olga. Hi, sorry, just middle of bedtime here. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I'm the PAC chair for David Livingston Elementary. We're currently going through our seismic upgrade our second year. So we're at the South Hill swing site, which makes everything a little bit extra challenging because um, we do have a bus service that um, shuttles kids from, the, from, the, um, from our actual school site to the swing site. So there's very sort of little parent interaction because people are just dropping off of the bus, taking, picking up. So there's not a lot of, um, everyone's have feeling that air of either, of not being this community that it used to be. And I'm still like brand new to the community because I um, have a son in grade one and a daughter in kindergarten. So I've only ever entered um, in the school system during COVID and at a swing site. So I'm sort of like completely lost. And um, yeah, somehow I ended up being the chair of the pack this year. And um, so, yeah, I really am looking forward to this training. So I'm feeling a little lost. I'm feeling a little um, overwhelmed, uh, a great sense of responsibility, which I, which I wanna do a really good job with. Now, Nate, you've come to the right place. You're <laughs> going to leave here with a few good takeaways. And you're also going to leave here with a network. Yeah, that's of, what I'm looking for, too. Yeah, so you're going to leave here with a network of people who will help and people who will share their ideas of what's worked for them. And that's, yeah. that's a key part. Perfect. Okay, uh, we're almost done. Olga and then Ryan. 
Hi, so yes, I'm Olga and I am the co-chair for Henry Hudson Pack. And, um, my son's just got out of kindergarten. I didn't go to school here in Canada, so I really don't know what I don't know. <laughs> so I'm really excited to um, learn as much as I can about how the pack works and um, to best move it forward. Thank you. Oh, awesome. Ryan, and then we're going to go back to Kitty and then anybody else that we missed. Uh, hi there, my name is Ryan. I am uh, Olga's uh, co-chair actually at uh, Henry Hudson. Okay. I, I have a, a daughter in kindergarten there as well and uh, a son who will get to kindergarten in, uh, in a few years. Uh, interesting, as the, the last person, we're also going through our... Uh, seismic update and we're doing uh, our schools at an on-site seismic update so the kids are all in school at the old building while the construction is just beginning to take place on the uh, field uh, right beside it so a different set of similar and different set of challenges probably with the uh, community around that uh, seismic upgrade yeah um so we're not going to talk a lot about the seismic program today, but uh, there, there's a lot of knowledge that we have at DPAC around the seismic mitigation program. We, we should put together that uh, like a seismic toolkit that we've been thinking about putting together for quite a while. Uh, we probably have all the bits and pieces for it. So this is a bit of motivation. We will put together a seismic toolkit and then share that with all packs as a separate topic. Um, and then finally for the introductions back to Kitty and then anybody that I missed. Okay, then we shall start. Okay, um, so Kanta, I will put up the presentation. So we're gonna lose um focus but i guess that's part of the or will we gain focus on the presentation <laughs> yeah i guess that's a good way to put it <laughs> yeah let's do it that way okay um does everyone see my screen and does everyone see just a presentation now it's in the uh we can see all the slides down the side and see the big screen that's Okay, so see somebody mm -hmm. see. Okay, my screen says loading now. Yeah, same here. Okay, and loading. Okay, what do we see now? Dun, 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 dun. That's the first slide. What a nice. Okay, slide. you know the the first slide. We should just give thanks to our graphic artist on uh, residence, uh, Karen. Thank you so much. I'm just being obnoxious. <laughs> <laughs> you deserve it. You do a great job. <laughs> okay, now we have really good fancy graphics. Pack 101, fall 2022. <laughs> Welcome, everyone. <laughs> uh, we got an outline here. Um, the outline is really for when this presentation is online and mm -hmm. we're looking at it. Um, so why are, why are there packs? So, you know, really we want to focus on what the difference is between fundraising and building community and creating belonging. So this is kind of really the, the focus of the discussion. Why don't you and lead us this things, way? One of the things I want to highlight on this slide is um, that every parent is automatically a member of the pack. I know that, um, you know, as I've gone through different levels of, of uh, working with our school packs that I've had multiple parents say to me, oh, I haven't joined the pack yet. And I find myself saying quite regularly, no, you are already a member of the pack. As soon as you have a kid going to this school, you are part of that community and we want to hear your voice. So I find that that is always really important to try and communicate with your school community. Yeah. So does anyone have any ideas of what does it mean 
to you know focus on building community and creating belonging what's a good example of that nora do you want to go and try yes uh, well i think with regard to building community i, I think that it's very important for people to actually know who what the community looks like and it's important not to be quote unquote colorblind uh, to just not look um, really it's very important to see who goes to your you know who's missing from your from your meetings or from your from your um, you know what whatever type of get togethers and to actually try to bring them in and to bring them in in a way um, not just to say oh, you can do the grunt work, actually to, to bring them in in a way that you give them some power so that they can, uh, and be willing to be changed by what they have to say. I, I think that, that that will really help people not only be included, but also to continue to be engaged. Great, that's fantastic. And, and I'll share one, you know, real, life learning that just recently happened to me and and to Deepak. So in in the spring, uh, Deepak was thinking about um, the idea of, you know, what do we do around forming a music committee? So then we formed a music working group. And then the music working group said, we're going to shadow the VSB's 10 year music vision. And we also want to implement some music, so we'll do an extracurricular program. And then that came uh, to all the packs, and then eleven packs said we like it. Would we would do a choir program? And then all the packs voted on it, and then we implemented the D Pack Music Working Group extracurricular choral program. And we got it up and running for September, and we launched it in seven schools, twelve choirs. 450 kids registered, uh, 51 kids got bursaries. So lots of really good momentum. But we did a lot of diligence on logistics, on the pricing, on the, the bursaries, on making it fair, making sure that no school is declined a program, getting enough conductors, lots of logistics. But we forgot one thing, which is really important. And that was what type of music is going to be sung and how does that create belonging? So think about that. So we got one complaint and then we got another complaint and then we got another complaint and we got another complaint. And we found out that our music program that we launched as DPAC was not fully inclusive. It was good in the sense that it had one lived experience and it had another lived experience and we were thinking of other lived experiences but it didn't really represent all the lived experiences in a very broad way and that was a problem and we said we're going to own it we said we accept that we were not inclusive with our program and we accept that we need to improve and we need to create that belonging. So that belonging can only get created in two ways. One is you have every lived experience represented in the music and every person sees themselves in the music and in belonging to the program. That's one way. Another way is what some people will want to explore is a more non-lived experience inclusivity so a more immersive inclusivity and that is something that we need to explore too so that's kind of the exploration and the path of learning that we're on to build that community and create that belonging for everybody so that's kind of you know a good example to mm -hmm. impart there um fundraising i think we all know about fundraising um and I think we talk more about that a little later in the presentation. Um, yeah. I don't know if you want to go into it now. Uh, okay, Kanta, why don't you introduce the next slide here? And if I can get it. 
Sounds good. Okay. Um, yeah. Why are there packs? Okay. This is a one. Here we go. <laughs> um, yeah. So PAC is an elected group of parents. Um, and I think it's really important to be aware of the school act and sort of what uh, governs you. But, you know, as we said, that all parents belong to the PAC. And uh, it's an opportunity to volunteer at your school and be part of that community. Um, PACs are not a social club. Um, we talked a lot about whether we were going to leave this in or not. Um, and I think, well, not I think, but we decided to leave it in because we thought it was worth discussion. Um, if there were any sort of examples or um, thoughts people had on why this is an important part or an important thing to touch on during the presentation. I don't know if anybody has any thoughts on that. Feel free to just speak up. Yes. It's uh, I see Karen's hand up. Karen, go ahead. Oh, well, Leona can go first and then I'll I'll take second. Okay. okay can you can you hear me? Absolutely, yeah. yeah. Okay. So yeah, it's it's important to I think it's very important to say that whether it hurts feelings or not, because it's a reality. Um, one of the big reasons I'm not, you know, particularly participating in my pack at Queen Alexander School or the one that we were at Mount Pleasant, because it just felt like um, I wasn't included. And when I tried to be part of a conversation, there was just, it, it just felt like a club, like we're gonna converse on what we wanna talk about and not have like an agenda to talk about anything for everybody to share. It really does feel like that, which is probably why you don't see a lot of indigenous participation because you don't feel included. You don't feel part of the conversation because these parents tend to pull this group in a way and make it a social gathering rather than an important school discussion. Mm -hmm. Thank you for bringing that up. Well, thank you for for sharing your experience. I I hear what you're saying, and I think it's really important that we include all the voices of our community on a pack. But uh, but Karen, you wanted to speak. Please go ahead. Yeah. Um. So I ran into somebody uh, last week had a chat with them, a neighbor who's new to town, somewhat new to town, and she's had some problems in her school. And I asked her why she hasn't talked to the pack. And she said it was because she didn't feel like they would take her issues seriously. And they, um, that they might not, hmm, that her circumstances had changed from what she had experienced elsewhere and she was really struggling and she felt embarrassed about that and so um, you know as much as a pack should be a place where people feel comfortable socializing um, it's super important to know that you have a job to do to make sure that you know and invite people in um, who who may not be the best socializers and I'm one of those people not very comfortable socializing so a social a, a social pack, if it's if it feels too cliquey, is somewhere that I would rather be out, um, you know, standing on my head on a busy street than be in something that doesn't feel like I belong there. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Karen. Nora. Yeah. Yeah. yeah uh, as as far as cliques go, it, it is very important that that the pack doesn't become a a clique with only representation from a small group of people in the school because PACs actually have a lot of power. And if it's concentrated uh, in the hands of a few people, it can be used in ways that are inequitable to other people. So it's very important. Uh, when I started at the school, they were advertising PAC positions and saying, grab a friend and, and share your, a position with a friend, but actually that's not really the best thing. It, uh, the PAC should be sort of widely representative. Thank Thanks, you. Nora. Um, Alicia? Yeah, thanks, Vic. So um, slightly different twist on this, but PACs are also sort of, you know, governing and oversight bodies for the school. Right. And so when you think about that, 
Um, it's really important for them to be inclusive and in thinking about the entire school community because that's who they're representing when they work with the principals and the staff. And so, and also to, you know, if you're, if you're just there to socialize, you're not actually doing your job of oversight, right? So there's a, a couple of different pieces of that that I think go along with what everyone else is saying, but just, just a slightly different twist. Mm -hmm. uh, thank you, everyone. Great feedback. Okay. Um, so, okay, next. I'm having a little... Okay, there we go. Here we go. <laughs> okay, so, um, you know, we, we, we talked about this. This is just recapping um, the mo most of the activities and the work that the PAC does should really try to focus around the building of the community. And, um, you know, the it's hard work versus let's raise some fundraising for this cause or that cause. It's a little more, you know, cookie cutter, a little more, you know, okay, easier, or there's a formula for it, or DPAC recommends, um, you know, this new uh, pot program that Garden Works is doing. And then, you know, you can easily adopt it and put it out to your membership and raise some money. So we need to do those kind of things, but what are we raising the money for is really the more important part. And are we raising the money for um, building community, building resiliency, building the kids' experiences, an extracurricular program, money for um, food programs, breakfast programs, enhancements for the kids, or is it, you know, more generic you know is it more funding that the government should kind of automatically do anyways is it for like technology um is it for playgrounds is it for like maintenance of a building like these are the kind of parts where it's it's a gray area whether we're funding and subsidizing the government's obligation mm -hmm. versus building the community ourselves so anybody I, anybody want to get i'm gonna jump in here back um, I know that I have in my experience with PACs that it's interesting watching uh, new people come into the PAC um, because you'll find that there are really diverse opinions on fundraising. Some people are really focused on the fundraising and some people focus on the fundraising with the interest of um, having community events to make money. And then, you know, but then there's also that discussion as you were saying of, are we using the money to pay for things that the school board or the pr province should be paying for? And, and where do we draw the line, right? Exactly. And you know, if your PAC needs computers, then what are you gonna do? Are you gonna wait? Or are you gonna say, no, we're gonna step up and get the money for the kids and get them computers now? So it's, it's a real problem of how do you, you know, deal with these issues, but then also, um, what is a broad line of equity if one pack is able to raise $200,000 for a beautiful artificial turf field mm -hmm. and another pack can't even raise $1,000 for essentials? And we do a have a program that we are using to try and I think level that field a little bit that we touch on later on. Yes. Mm -hmm. Pack to pack. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, uh, the BC uh, CPAC leadership manual. Um, Nora, did you want to talk about this a little bit? Are oh, you on mute, Nora? Um, yeah, uh, the BC CPAC manual, I, I think is probably sort of the reference that people should use if they have any questions with regard to any kind of operations. It's very, very comprehensive and it's written down. And then um, if people have questions, they can follow up with the DPAC or the BCC PAC as well. But I, I think it's a, a great reference. And surprisingly, maybe a lot of PACs don't know about it, but it, it covers every issue that 
that that you might want to like that you might be considering me. I, I, I think so. Yeah, I, I highly recommend it. That's great. Um, so also what ends up usually happening is um, a lot of PACs will email DPAC and then we will look it up or we will get that answer and we'll get that help. So if it's not in the manual or you know what, it's just a question that you'd rather just have someone else give you the exact answer because you don't want to dig around, just email DPAC. We probably have the answer. So um, a lot of the work that is already out there, um, you know, like constitution bylaws, so many PACs have written good ones. We can share those ones with other PACs. So all that kind of stuff can be helped out. And then the other part I just want to touch on here is when it comes to the next part of our presentation um, is we're now we're going to be going into what is inclusivity and diving a little deeper into that. So I wanted to start off with a delegation here. So Alicia, are you ready? Yes, I'm ready. And do you do you prefer a background or do you prefer um, us going off oh, the screen share? <laughs> I'm flexible. Whatever anybody wants, this is fine. Um, fine, okay. Since, so uh, just just didn't want to take up too much time, but I did want to talk about the DPAC Black and Indigenous Working Group, and I'm so grateful to have both Leona and Alec here who are on the DPAC with, uh, in this working group with us. Uh, the main reason I, we wanted an opportunity to speak with you all today is because we are looking for more members. Um, we are a small but mighty group right now. Uh, but as with everything, the more people you have, the easier it is to get things done. So um, we are hoping that you will go back to your PACs and let them know that we exist and that we are there to support uh, any of the Indigenous and Black members of your school, but also that we hope that they will want to be engaged and to join us. Um, you know, sometimes people feel like they need a space where they feel as though they're safe and they can um, bring up their concerns. And that's one of the things that we um, hope to do with the working group. A few of the other things that I think uh, we're going to look at focusing on over the next year or so, and these are things that we haven't fully decided upon yet, but I think are kind of inherent to what we hope to accomplish. So uh, Leona and Alec, feel free to step up and say uh, that I've got this wrong. Uh, but there, there are primarily three things uh, that I think we're going to really look at. It's empathy. So how do we build uh, empathy into our curriculum and into our schools? This is really fundamental for anything. When you think about uh, unconscious bias, one of the ways you can break through that is by building a sense and an under and, and, and the skills that are required to have empathy. I was completely shocked when my son said to me when we were having a conversation with a family friend that he didn't get anything on empathy in school. And um, I really hope that's because we came into the system when he was in the seventh grade and hopefully the younger children are getting that but uh, he's not gotten it while he's been in high school and uh, I think it's a fun to, as somebody you know as many of us are probably out there in the working world this is like a key skill that people need to have um, and I think it's it goes to inclusivity um, in many ways being able to relate to people that uh, are like you and who are not like you and also being able to accept people for who they are and understanding that they ha might have different circumstances than you. Um, so that's one. The second one is a clear and um, unbiased disciplinary process. Right now the process is mm, murky to really know that everyone is being treated equally throughout. And then as we talk about bringing SLOs back, 
uh, that just complicates the matter even further. So that would be one of the other things that we would want to work on. And then uh, really also working to bring more indigenous and black culture and experiences into the social studies and history curriculum. And of course, curriculum is somewhat determined or mostly determined um, at the ministry level, but there are things that the district can do on this as well. And this is one of those areas where, you know, as Vic mentioned earlier, kind of when you you raise, oh, I get this wrong all the time, but you know, when you raise things for one group, it raises it for everyone. Um, I truly believe that the curriculum needs to be more global and not just considering sort of a traditional European centric um, when we're talking about history and social studies. And so uh, thinking, I had a woman a professor at SFU who told me she went to Rwanda and was just so sad that she knew nothing about that that country's history and background. And of course, we can't learn about everything, but we need to learn about these things in a very positive light. And there are many parts of the world that we really learn very little about. Um, so I think there needs to, that's one of the other areas that we would really like to focus on. And then um, lastly, I'll just add also that one of the things that we are have been working on is uh, building a database and we're doing this in cooperation with the um, BC Community Alliance uh, that would allow us to track racist incidents in the education system. So those are the things that we're working on or hoping to accomplish, um, looking for more people to join us and uh, thank you for your time. Alicia, thank you. And then, so of course, Leona and Alec, if you wanted to add anything. So sorry. <laughs> Leona, Alec? Um, you did well explaining in that, all of that. Um, yeah, we need to, we need more participation in this, this working group. Um, a lot more. And the only way it's going to happen is through the PACs. Um, and being welcoming and, and actually doing the work that they're supposed to be doing. And, um, you know, we're here if, if they need to reach up, but I, it would be great to see more Indigenous working at the PAC level than, than going up the ladder to complain. Um, and that takes all of us for, for that to happen, to welcome um, Black and Indigenous parents into groups. So we, we could do it. <laughs> yes, we can. Oh, thank you. Uh, Alec, anything to add? Yes, but I see that Christy has her hand up. So I will I will hold up and uh, let Christy oh, ask her question or make a comment. You. Sorry, Alec. I just got so excited. I, I'm going to turn my background off just because um, uh, I just wanted to share this awesome book one of my professors uh, shared with us. It says, oh, uh, so I bought it when we say Black Lives Matter. And so I just thought, oh, it would be so, I don't know if this is in, in other like schools or anything, but uh, we scream out Black Lives Matter and we march against Falling Night. We were, we're saying enough is enough and we need to pull things right. Like there's so many like, and it's just beautiful like, the pictures in here so if I don't know if you're like looking for a book or anything to bring into your schools or to see like because sometimes I find that the resources like the schools don't know what to get like my kids mm -hmm. didn't know like they're like well how come is this indigenous book us and I was like no it's not and no that one doesn't represent us either and so things like that so I just like I guess making recommendations to schools like you should get this book and here's a good book and here's some more good books so kids see those and it opens up that dialogue not that teachers don't need to include it they do but like it also sparks that dialogue outside of class too so that's what I just want to say but beautiful presentation thank you Alex sorry about that thank you so much Christy thanks Christy and yeah I 
just agree with Leona that Alicia, you uh, you did a fantastic job summing it up. But I just wanted to kind of echo it and, and add my my own kind of comments um, that uh, you're totally right that the curriculum is set by not us and not the individual schools. But for some background, I actually don't have any children. Um, I have a nephew that is a future attendee of Vancouver School Board schools, uh, but I. I'm just here to motivated by making the school system a little bit better and more accessible for Musqueam children and other Indigenous kids too. Um, and uh, I actually do quite a bit of cultural work with BSB these days. Um, mm. They have started um, whenever they do, like for example, they did an unveiling of a mural by Indigenous artists at the Strathcona Elementary School. And they did it in our way, our ancestors' way, by having um, myself and my cousin Morgan be speakers on behalf of the family. Uh, we called witnesses and unveiled the name on the floor. Um, so I actually see a lot of different schools within uh, the VSB system. And it is wild how different the levels of education are on, from my perspective, at least just indigenous issues. So while we uh, have a curriculum that's set by um, authorities such as the province, uh, in practice, those curriculums are very wildly different. And so uh, the communities that are around the schools are just as important in terms of what the children learn. Uh, and so any and all participation in um, increasing awareness on social issues and breaking barriers for Black and Indigenous kids, like that's super important on the local level. So, so important. So for those of you who um, have uh, um, Black and Indigenous parents or parents of Black and Indigenous kids um, in your schools, like just echoing, we really would love more Black and Indigenous voices on that working group. And if you aren't Black or Indigenous, there's plenty that you can be doing to advance uh, the betterment of the school system for those kids by doing things like uh, finding out what we're up to at the Black Indigenous Working mm -hmm. Group when we come to DPAC or, or PAC events uh, and speak on stuff, like listen with an open heart and open mind. Uh, I uh, There's a Slack that I don't know how active it is because I actually uh, got a new phone and we're up with Slack on my phone. But we have an anti-racism Slack that is open to not just the Black Indigenous Working Group, but parents and uh, uh, staff from the school board that are interested in anti-racism work. And there's uh, opportunities to join there and listen to uh, minority voices. And usually if there is some action that we can be all taking together, uh, it might be posted there. So there's something that everybody can do, um, even if it's just listening and echoing, that's still really important because the individual schools and uh, the kids that are in them are really affected by the DPAC and the individual. So I just wanna uh, echo Alicia's sentiment in inviting you to participate if you're black or indigenous, spread the word for those parents and be prepared to listen with an open heart and open mind and support the work of Black and Indigenous parents. Hi, Chuka. Sorry, I was rambling and speaking a bit fast there, but I'm feeling real passionate tonight. Alec, that was very well said. Um, Alicia, thank you. Christy, thank you. Leona, thank you. Um, I do want to reflect and summarize. Um, Deepak is a complete ally in this work. Um, the three things that were mentioned, empathy, unbiased decision-making, and sharing of the culture in a way that is in reflected inside the curriculum. And even if that, you know, that gave me some motivation just to think, well, maybe there's a way that we can create some extracurricular uh, curriculum and you know, you know, do that as part of the anti-racism 
working group um, to cover other cultures as well as Black and Indigenous, but I think there would be some very good emphasis and there's some good learning already around um, months to do it in and we could probably look at something like that that's more meaningful to uh, attract you know more people to the cause to actually create the work that needs to get done but thank you um, lots of ideas to share and lots of more learning to do together and on that learning to do together we would love to invite the black and indigenous working group to have a bit of a five minute recap at every DPAC general meeting. So, mm -hmm. you know, consider that as an open invite so that this is not a one-time ask, but this is a perpetual ongoing journey that we're on and that we grow together. Mm -hmm. So thank you. Um, Kanta, I'm gonna hand the next slide back over to you. So we have some, okay. Uh, okay, there we go. Okay, to fact number one. What is fact number one? Um, yes, we do. We have political, social, and cultural power. And I think that is, uh, a lot of that comes from a group of people who are willing to put their time and their voice into representing their community. Um, it also, as you can see, comes from um, the bylaws and uh, rules that govern us, the constitution. Um, I'm going to leave that for people to refer to later. But um, having these policies and um, uh, sort of general rules that we, we use to be able to structure our meetings using the agenda um, allows us to hear all voices and represent our community. Um, and I think that's pretty much all I have to say on that. Nora, please speak. <laughs> yeah, um, thank you. I, I think that, you know, power is something that would be very good for everybody to meditate on because really that's the central issue of things like racism or anti-racism. And for me, I think it's very, important that you know that that you know packs uh, know pack executives know what kind of power they have uh, because in order to be anti-racist that power has to be shared with people who are marginalized and um, and I think the other issue that came up in my experience is that uh, I once belonged to a pack that they, they were they, they wanted to do good things for people, but they wanted to do it very, very efficiently. And so they tried to reduce quorum from eight to five because they thought that that would be, you know, that that would help them do things better. But the, the impact of that was that, um, well, the Im impact of, of that was that it really negatively affected a lot of people. So, um, and so I just wanted to put it out there that um, that if you have power, you have to know what it is and and try, you know, to to let other people sort of have a chance to do some of these things like set the agenda, you know, speak at meetings and whatnot. Yes, very much welcoming the entire community in. That's thank you, Nora. Did you, uh, Madeline, did you want to say something? Yeah, um, and maybe it's coming up. So if it is, I, I obviously can wait for that slide. Um, what Nora just said about the meditating on the power um, and PAC execs, I've actually been feeling, well, maybe it's just a general feeling I often feel, but uh, not powerless, but, um, uh, we recently have started, um, uh, we've, we've expanded our social emotional learning group to be also uh, justice, equity, diversity, inclusion, and also a separate specific truth and reconciliation focus at our school subgroup. Um, and uh, some of the people, some of the parents came up with ideas like, 
let's let's have a day where we can go to the library and and look through some of the books because we know some of them just you know like the the stuff that was you know acceptable once upon a time isn't now so let's just go in the group and go through some books and see what's see what's potentially offensive that hasn't been you know marked yet and and help the librarian out or help you know so that parents and kids you don't go home with books with poor representation and and uh the response was well we've got a librarian and that's the school and the the school has the library and stuff so that's not your part it's like oh okay um and then we had sort of an idea to do something else or like support um ongoing we know that there's like professional days and teachers only have one I think that's dedicated to truth and reconciliation or learning about local indigenous knowledge culture stories if, and the whatnot and we just we're feeling like that's that's a massive gap that's not enough so maybe we could do something as packed to offer more um opportunities like and that was like no you can't do that that's not you know the there are certain specific policies and structures that set up the professional days and you can't you know so I've been feeling like the the ideas that have kind of come up get shot down like you don't you don't actually have any power to do that like there's structures within the school board and that's how it's done so I don't know if that's going to be touched on but um sort of the idea of parents who are excited to want to help and do something and then just told no that this is how we do it that's not your place yeah um maddie so that's you know coming right up um so packs are not level playing fields right and you know the i'll, I'll reflect that i reflect on myself all the time i have time i have money i have a lot of privilege to be able to do what i am doing and with that, you know, comes that responsibility to go out of my way to make sure that I include voices, to go out of my way to make sure that I try to do my utmost best not to be a mainstream popularity matters kind of person and to lose core values. And I think that's where society's at in a lot of ways, in the sense that, you know, collectively as a society, we do compromise our core values for general popularity. And that shows up in places that are very, very harmful. Um, you know, we make decisions like going back to like, you know, what got me involved in advocacy and in education was fundamental unfairness in our seismic mitigation program where the public is not allowed to be involved in whether a decision is a seismic upgrade or a partial replacement or a full replacement. If we were allowed to be involved, then I wouldn't have such a big beef, but we're not allowed to be involved. Like that's not democratic. That's why I'm here. And that's what got me here. Now I'm a multi-issue parent, but I reflect on what got me here, why I'm here, and you know, on my privilege. And I think every PAC leader needs to reflect on their privilege. Why are they a leader? How do they become a leader? What's their responsibility to be a leader? That's, I think, where you're going, Maddie, and I'd like you to finish your train of thought. Um, I, I, I mean, I, I definitely like what you just uh, brought up, and I, I definitely recognize that people who have the privilege of time um, are able to uh, be here and be at their packs and advocating. Um, I think, I think where I, what, the main thing is just understanding how much power a PAC has, uh, up against like the school board for like, uh, uh, Alicia just touched on it. Um, I don't know if it's Alicia or Alicia, I think it's Alicia. 
um, touched on that's it. Okay. It's, a, it's Alicia. But that's Alicia. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Okay. I thought I heard that. Alicia. Um, uh, on uh, like cops back in schools. I'm sure everyone has different. I mean, I know everyone has different opinions about it, but cops back in schools. Um, if everyone in the D pack and everyone on all the packs, you know, we're like, no, um, how do you, and you went to the school board and the school board's all, yes. Like how much power does a pack have? I guess it is kind of what I'm looking at. Like how, where, where, where's our power <laughs> to, to say, I'd like to actually see teachers have more anti-racism training or self-reflective training like where where is that I guess that's my question where that where where is that how much power do we have against the system well I, I think that goes a lot into what kind of leadership do we want to have at the DPAC and at the PAC level so I'll speak for DPAC and our leadership and what we want to do around um, things like the slow program which are very complicated so the slow program um, is something where DPAC has taken a very clear position on that we want the voices of the Black and Indigenous people to be centered. That's what was done in the past, and that's what got the slow program removed. And we supported that. And we want the same thing for the future is, look, if you're looking at anything regarding slows, are you talking to the Black and Indigenous people? Are you getting their input and their not only just consultation, but their involvement? And involvement is that word of IAP2 that says it's got to be concurrence into the VPD and VSB memorandum of understanding that you're thinking about for the future. That's where we would want it to start as concurrence and involvement. And if we're not doing that, then there's a problem, right? So we will take our core values as DPAC and say, our core values to center these voices is paramount importance. Anything in the future has to have that. And if it doesn't, then DPAC is not gonna support it whatsoever. So that's you know our leadership. And if every PAC had the same kind of leadership, then it's an extremely powerful voice. BPAC can also um, represent, or part of our role is to represent the PAC. So I know that we have, sorry, and Karen, you want to speak as well. I just quickly want to uh, touch on that if, what is it, 10 PACs come to us or 11 yeah. PACs come to us and have an agreement on, they've all voted that they uh, particularly want one particular thing or uh, a particular from Vancouver School Board that we then will take that to Vancouver School Board and advocate for whatever that is. Karen, sorry, I don't want to hold you up any longer. No, that's okay. Um, I think that partly, Madeline, um, I don't know what the relationship you or other parents have with the librarian, for example, but I think some of the things at the school level um, sometimes for those of us, and I really hate the word passionate, but for those of us who take our responsibilities very seriously. Um, so for example, um, you are connected to the acts of reconciliation and making sure that, um, that we are not leaving another report to gather dust on a shelf. Um, I think sometimes we are not necessarily, and I can definitely speak for myself, so I'll speak in the eye, I'm not always great at, at fostering a relationship first and, and, um, and figuring out, for example, how to have a conversation with the librarian and not necessarily get the principal involved to, you know, to gently kind of offer assistance or, or, or whatever that looks like. But I think that um, the relationships are so important. And you know, not all of us, and specifically me, um, is very strong in that area. <laughs> so I, I don't have any, any any easy answers, but I keep hearing people say, you know, relationships are everything. <laughs> so <laughs> that's that. Nailed it, thanks. <laughs> Great. Okay, Kanto, let's do another slide.
Oh, uh, okay. No, we have Karen. Karen, would you like oh. to talk about the $4.7 million student and family affordability fund? Um, yeah, we worry about the decision making at senior staff levels. Um, and we are very much interested in uh, centering the voices of people who are meant to be benefiting from that fund over people who, again, may or may not be analyzing their privilege in a way that makes them aware of what is actually needed versus what they think is needed or places they want to put the money. So um, we are knocking up a working group for this one, um, headed actually by Sandra um, or, or organized by Sandra and I, but Sandra will be the person um, in the meetings. So we are looking for parents from PACs, parents and caregivers um, from, from PACs. And um, actually, because it's a working group, we can also have people who might, um, for example, uh, someone from a neighborhood house could be in this working group um, if they're working with families um, to ensure that the that the board itself has people telling them what's needed over what they're going to imagine is needed. So we're definitely looking to populate that group and figuring out how to do that quickly. Um, we are open to suggestions. Um, and I just, I'm just going to add, because I'm going to have to tuck out, um, that we are also forming uh, what will probably be a committee. Um, so I'm just going to veer off for a second, but I promise like two minutes maximum. Um, for parents of kids with um, different disabilities or neurodiversity, um, so kids who need attention outside of kind of the general population that fits fits reasonably into an education mold. Um, so that committee would probably have um, within it certain groups, uh, certain natural um, affinity groups, which might be kids who are neurodiverse, um, kids who are um, being excluded. Um, so, so that group is a group that we're also asking PACs to maybe identify people who might be interested. Um, they can email me, Karen, well, actually, it's easy to do secretary at VancouverDPAC.org, um, or you can just send it to our general email and I'll get it um, for anyone who's interested. But, and this is my last minute, the idea of these groups is that DPAC is as big or as small as we imagine it to be. And the more people that do their work under the umbrella of DPAC, um, the more they have to take us seriously. And secondly, um, each, we hope that within each of these groups, there, the people in these groups would back up the other groups, right? So you might be on a group for, um, because you have neurodiverse child, but, um, but if the black and indigenous working group says, hey, this is what we need, we, we sort of expect that people will be at a place where they're like, yes, we support those people and their voice because we as parents of neurodiverse children understand that we need people to show up for us, right? Um, and there's gonna be lots of intersections. So we're expecting people to come into these groups ready to do the work and to meet each other where they're at. But we would like to um, put more tables into the DPAC system so that more people can speak to the school board or at least we as the administration of, of DPAC um, have, you know, let's say 10 voices at a table, not just ourselves saying, oh, we're hearing these things, but we have a group that's talking about these things. There are 20 people in this group um, so that we can be less dismissed. Okay, that's me. I finished hogging time. Thank you very much. Karen, that was very important. Um, I just want to emphasize um, you know, in an example way. So the Student and Family Affordability Fund is a $60 million fund that the province gave to the school districts. So the school districts, because the school districts have people who are hyper-local, who can identify families and students who need extra resources and help. So that's what the government's intention was. So that comes down to the school districts. The government said to the school districts, make sure you consult your DPACs. 
So then we need to be consulted. So what did we do? We basically said, okay, let's crowdsource some ideas. So we did that. We wrote a letter um, with crowdsourced ideas to the district and we had initial conversation with the district and our initial conversation was, yep, yeah, your plan to, you know, um, one-time funds, use it is not bad, but we need to get, dive into the details of how you're going to allocate this money and what we see as two rocks right now, two big rocks, is nobody in the community will understand one-time money and why it can't be used towards food in schools. So you're going to have to deal with that and go over that perception somehow because everyone's going to expect better food in schools. So that's one rock. Another rock is we know that this money could help a lot of families increase and rapidly improve their kids' student outcomes if their students got assessments. So that's another rock, that hurdle that you need to overcome. And then we said, well, we need to dive deeper and find out what the, you know, the, the community needs really are. So we'll form a specialized working group. And that's what Karen just talked about. So that's the specialized working group where we want the real ideas and real feedback of how do you actually help families in need? How do they get identified? And what should PAC leaders know? We want to get that part done as well. So that's the closing on the Student and Family Affordability Fund. Thank you, Karen. Thank you, Sandra, for running that. Okay, and uh, Karen, I know you got to leave, so thank you. Thanks. Okay, and then back to you, Kanta, for PACs can make a real difference. They can, and I think this goes hand in hand with the next one as well. Um, so I think actually what I'm going to do is ask you to move on to the next one, and I'm, nope, not that one. There we go. Um, <laughs> so um, to make a difference, I think we need to be aware of our roles. Um, there is a code of ethics, and that is a really important um, part of the leadership manual to be aware of. Um, how finances are handled and uh, how our documents are handled and um, how we record what PACs do. But part of uh, a, a big part of the importance of a PAC and the what can come out of a PAC is how your powers are exercised. So as um, has been stated by others, um, you know, bringing in the entire community and including everyone, um, making sure that if you're in a dual stream school that both streams are represented. So you're inviting the entire community and hearing the entire community um, during your meetings or when you're looking for feedback. Well, at all times, actually. Um, because everybody in your community has experience and has knowledge that is really important to what a PAC can do and will only make you stronger. Um, I think that's all I have to say on that. Oh, Karen has a comment. Um, no, sorry, that was just somebody asked for an explanation of slow. So I put that into the chat before I leave. Awesome. Okay. <laughs> um, yeah. So if there's any, any comments or any thoughts anybody has that they want to add to that, that's of course welcome. No, we're good. No hands, okay. Um, so we're gonna conclude this section with a video if it plays. No, uh, will it play? Is it playing? Looks like it might. I have to duck out. I'm about to lose power, so I'll be right back. Okay. When I'm having a right head experience, then the idea is my group's culture, my group's more, right? My group's ways of doing. Can anybody hear that? Yeah, it was working for me. Yes. Oh. It was fine. 
Excellent. Great. Okay. Great. Okay. Um, so that that concludes the you know this slide here will conclude our our side on um, our, our section today on inclusivity and on the importance of that in in impacts um, because you know it revolves around making sure that we build that belonging create that deep sense of what we want the future of all our kids and how they should behave and interact with each other. Um, so that's really what the key part here is, is that what we want to do is have that inclusive community is a win for every person. When we ally with each other and we, we all bring each other up then, that's really what we end up doing. Any other final words on this part? Nora, you see your hands up. Yes. Um... Sometimes I think that it's very good if you could have somebody of another culture, like somebody who wasn't brought up in the West to actually be part of the of the executive because they'll be able to bring a different perspective and, and they're not part of the majority. And so um, we found at our pack that by including people who were not from the West, that they they were actually very, much, very, very good about building, being inclusive because they know they knew what it was to be left out. And so they were very, very active in creating like, you know, social opportunities for people like coffee times and whatnot. So, so yeah, I, I would suggest if possible that, you know, people try to include them um, because that's one step further than just listening to them and then speaking for them. And, and how, how are you successful in, in getting them to join the executive? Well, first of all, I think it might be a multi-stage thing, but I, I think that if any of them have an idea or if you can encourage one, um, one of them to have an idea, maybe something about like, you know, organizing something, you know, if they can, if they do it, then they'll, they'll have more confidence. Once you start doing something for the school, you, uh, people build up that sense of an engagement and with that engagement comes more confidence. So, so, um, I think that maybe, you know, 
whatever a person might be interested in, like something like a multicultural festival would be very good because then you can get you know, people from different cultures to to sort of contribute something. And then out of that, there might be some people who, who are real leaders, right? And, and then then if you can give them a seat, they'll just organize, they'll, they'll organize themselves, right? And, and that's real, uh, that really helps, right? Because otherwise sometimes, uh, if if somebody speaks for somebody else, it might be like sort of a a case of benevolent paternalism, right? It's better for, you know, to to allow these people to have seats at the table and to have share the power, and then then they'll take it their own way. <clears throat> Nora, I, I love that because it it really it's really about creating an environment that's welcoming. And people will then step up. And you know, we have um, now again, Nora. Thank you so much. We put together so much content. Uh, you put together so much content that at the end of our presentation here, we do have uh, a pack two hundred one. So creating an inclusive pack. Um, this is a preview of the winter. Uh, so we'll do another one of these, and this one has all the ideas of actual implementation and so much more that we can get into. So this is not the end of this. Uh, PAC 201 is going to be coming up. Um, but now I would like to talk about, you know, there is a bit of a section a session here on, um, and I think we should just do this part here and then we will take a little break and then we'll do the 10,000 view. Um, so Sandra, you have your hand up first. Now go ahead, Sandra. Um, I was actually, uh, about, um, what Nora said, um, I think that's a great idea. And my concern is like, how do you do this? Like I've, I've found such a difference between elementary school and high school since Christopher's moved on to high school. It's like the parents don't go to the school to, to drop off their kids, like there's nobody sees each other. Um, like how how are you finding people to bring them in? You know, include I just, them. I just started a walking group, and what I found is that I've like there are not a lot of parents, but there are parents who are are very very new to the community, and I think from there I, I think that I'd like to try to see if the pack chair is open to having things like coffee times and whatnot. Um, I'm not really sure what what it'll be like, but I, I'm working on it. And hopefully, you know, hopefully things can go as well as they did at the elementary level. I think maybe at the high school level, there isn't as much community building. Yeah, but, it's yeah, hard. Yeah. yeah, but I, I think that the walking group has been very successful in, in terms of just meeting new people. Yeah, and then, I actually brought that up to, I think maybe you had mentioned it before, somebody had mentioned a walking group, and I actually brought that up to the Templeton Pack um, for starting a walking group and coffee times and stuff like that. Like, I'm trying to build more community, but it's kind of hard at the high school level, I think. It, it is much harder at the high school level, um, but that's a good topic. Uh, there's been some packs have been quite successful at the high school level so we should maybe put that in a pack to pack and share some ideas in the pack to pack slack yeah okay That's so can I like that a lot thanks Bert. i'm gonna make it no problem so can I let's let's do this um the meetings part and then let's take a little break sounds good um these kind of go all together um so maybe we could just kind of go over the next three a little bit quickly sure if that's okay pick and then i think that's a really good place to break break yeah um so pack meetings there's uh you know you'll find that as you as you take over from the previous that there is sort of a best practices of setting an agenda as a group um so that you're allowing all voices to be heard, um, establishing meeting rules and procedures. Some people stick very strictly, I guess, 
um, I'm not sure I like the use of that word, to uh, Robert's rules, or as Vic says, which I quite like, he uses Bob's rules, um, which is a little bit more of a relaxed version of Robert's rules. Um, making sure that, as I said, all parents have a voice and keeping discussions relevant. Um, I think that goes back to it not being a social club, that this is a place to focus on the kids and the school and the community um, and not just to hang out with friends. Um, and being sure to thank parents. Uh, as well, it's really important everybody is aware that DPAC has Zoom licenses um, for PACs to use. So um, if you haven't already been contacted, uh, likely all schools have, but if you haven't been contacted by your DPAC representative, please reach out to us. Um, we are able to set up your meetings ahead of time and then we log in and give you the hosting for the meeting so that you're able to just freely use that meeting space for your school. Um, and we have found that, you know, Zoom meetings do allow for really good attendance because people don't have to travel. It's easier for childcare. If you could go back again, Vic, I just yeah. wanted to point out there uh, is a link which you won't be able to click on right now. I'll actually put it in while people, I'll put it in the chat while people are taking a break. But um, DPAC has been working on um, a working document um, regarding uh, meeting protocols for schools and well, specifically for DPAC, but can also be used by schools. If you are looking at doing in-person meetings again, um, I know that everybody is very tired of talking about COVID, but it is a virus. And I think we have become more aware of some people's comfort levels uh, versus others. And it's really important to create an inclusive space for everybody. So we're trying to just provide some guidelines that really do allow for that inclusivity. Um, so yeah, I will put that link in there. And then also, of course, when you're able to access the document, um, when you're able to access the document from the website, but uh, you'll be able to access that link there too. Is there anything anybody want to add to that? Anyone who might have experience with PACs or any thoughts you might have? No, I think that's pretty good. Right. So uh, we talked a lot about um, diversity, and that's just another highlight there. And then um, PAC records, we're going to cover a lot about PAC record keeping and finances um, at the Treasury 101 coming up. So just, you know, very high level here is just very important to make sure that the really, really important stuff is well documented, right? So voting, uh, motions regarding money, um, records, financial records, all those should be really tight because there's lots of misunderstandings that have happened um, just because of bad record keeping. So that's really the takeaway here is let's just not let, have any misunderstandings due to shoddy record keeping. And then, you know, succession planning is super important. The way that, um, our DPAC way of succession planning, our strategy is to allow lots and lots of parents to get involved in DPAC in really great ways on their specialty. Mm -hmm. So, you know, Black and Indigenous Working Group, Anti Racism Working Group, DPAC Music Working Group, DPAC Facilities Committee, DPAC Child Care Committee. Um, you know, DPAC Special Needs and Neurodiverse Committee that Karen just mentioned, that's a new group that we're going to launch. So these are really meaningful ways where people can get involved, contribute their specialty, and then if they like it, then they can look at being multi-issue and expanding. Kanta, go ahead. I just want to add that uh, I had a little memory pop up when you were talking about this. The first time I ever saw a pack 101 was long ago, pre-pandemic, sitting in John Oliver. And the person who was um, presenting said something that has stuck with me until this day, that your succession planning starts in September, that it is engaging the community, as you're saying, bringing people in, 
uh, to be part of, part of and have a voice in the community. And that is how your succession planning happens. Um, and that really, that really obviously made an impact. The fact that I'm mentioning it many years later. That's a great one. Okay, so with that, I think we're gonna take a break. Um, this is a bit of where Maddie, you were talking about. So let's just focus on this a little bit before we take the break. Um, so what happens when, you know, you, you're a PAC and you have um, some desires to implement at your school and, you know, you're not having the best delivery of them or you're not the best relationship. So what is the relationship between a PAC and the school? So, you know, starters, uh, the PACs have a legislative right to advise on any matter. So anything that goes on in that school, the PAC has a right to advise. So whether it's an operational matter, whether it's a governance matter, the PAC doesn't have to worry about who's responsible or what's going on here. Is it policy or is it procedure? You don't have to worry. You just have to state the problem and say, look, we care about this and we want to do something about it. So that's basically the idea. Um, the relationship between the admin is extremely important to have some concurrence on agreement that this is important and we should do this for the school community. Without the concurrence of the admin, then it becomes really hard to move the ball forward for you know, the school. So that relationship is important. That relationship should be one of mutual respect. And it should be one where the rationale that the PAC has should be extremely clearly understood and then the answer should be based on that rationale in a very meaningful way of yes, we can do it or no, we can't. And here's a hurdle. Here's what prevents us from doing it. I wonder if anyone um, who's attending has any thoughts on how they've been able to uh, build a good relationship with their admin or any suggestions um, on, on past experiences they've had. Look for some hands. I mean, I can talk some more. <laughs> Go ahead, provide one example, Kat. Okay. <laughs> so I know um, when I stepped into the PAC co chair role, um, you know, we've been lucky in that we're a small school, but one of the things that really helped us uh, set the tone for the year was in the spring. Um, the co-chairs would sit down with the principal and build the calendar for the following year um, and have a chance to say, you know, okay, we want to, you know, we want to have these community building events and what are the important things that are happening? You know, do you want us to uh, pay for a tennis program, which we usually did? When are you going to roughly plan to have that? And just so that we could just sit down in a really informal way and have those conversations to find out what was important to each other. Um, and not everything was solved, but it was it was a good relationship builder. And it had us, uh, allowed us a chance to figure out how we were gonna work together during that coming year. Great. Okay, so next, next topic is a 10,000 foot view. There's gonna be a, uh, you know, a lot of graphics on this one. And I'm gonna put one of the graphics up as background for our, we'll take a, we'll take a four minute break. Um, and for that four minutes, you guys will see, this is one graphic that was custom made by our own Amanda Hillis. And Amanda is a BC Ed gem. So she made this, updated yeah. just last night for DPAC. And we really appreciate it because I saw this older version of this slide, which is the Vancouver School District organizational chart. So I saw the one that was from 
last year's version. And, and I looked at it and I go, wow, this is amazing. How was this done? And I thought, well, it's probably Amanda. <laughs> so I emailed him, I mean, I, I texted Amanda and I said, look, Amanda, did you do this? And she said, yeah, I did it. <laughs> I go, okay. And I wasn't expecting uh, it to be revised, but she revised it for us. So this is amazing. This is our background for our break and we'll come back to it and talk about it in four minutes. Sounds good. See you all in four. Ministry of Okay, recording started again. Sorry. So we're at the 10,000 view. We're talking about the school, then the school district, and then the Ministry of Education and Child Care. So that's a big difference now that is new. And then the Treasury Board is the, um, you know, the final funding authority. And then there's so many other players as well that are involved in the whole system. Right. And then there are stakeholders and then the key players and then, you know, lots and lots of um, unions and then, um, you know, the, 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 the other people involved in um, like the, you know, the, the association that will do the um, teacher salaries is a, a different association um, that is the BC Public School Employers Association that liaisons with the, like the BC Teachers Federation and then sets the teacher salaries, for example. So there's lots and lots of you know different players involved and lots of complexity. But the key part here to understand is at the PAC level, what is you know who are the key players. And what should the PAC be responsible for? And who does a PAC liaison with throughout the chain? So the PAC advises the school on any matter that involves the school. Um, and then the chain there is to the Vancouver District Parent Advisory Council, the DPAC that advises the school board on any matter. And then that rolls into the BC Confederation of Parent Advisory Councils, BC CPAC, which advises the ministry. So that's kind of where that line of where parents are um, has its evolution. So that's kind of the key takeaway. It's really uh, good to understand how complex everything is, but also where we fit in and where our role and our hierarchy is and where we escalate matters. Uh, Kent, anything to add on this one? No, I think you've you've highlighted the important parts and I think, you know, the fact that this will be accessible allows people to come back and, and take some time and really look at it. Um, and yeah. uh, oh, we have a question from Maddie. What is the official designation or definition of advise? Uh, of which one? Of advise, of the term to advise. Yeah, so, um, you know, I don't know what the official designation is. Um, the way that I would look at it is, you know, there's probably three kinds of advice that you could, you could give. One is a breakthrough you know piece of advice that if we did this it would revolutionize things and it would be so much better um and i think those would be hard to come by and i think the second piece of advice that we would give is the kind of daily advice that we see something that could be improved and we say here's some advice to improve things and that's a daily incremental philosophy of you know continual improvement so I think that's, you know, really important. And then a third type would be to combine, you know, a bit of a breakthrough and an incremental improvement to do things 
in a different way that you know hasn't been thought of before but it's not necessarily a total brand new way of doing things it's maybe a way of doing things in another area that's already been done before and proven but we want to do it over here too so advice would be on any matter you have a legislative right to give advice on any matter the way that it would live and breathe daily is we see a problem we know how to you know make it better here's some advice on how to make it better please listen to us and let's improve the lives of kids right so that would be the daily where we live in terms of advice does that help maddie <laughs> it does i'm just so curious about like the the um you've given some advice or advising and then you don't have to expect a response to it necessarily that people don't have to take the advising they can say thanks for that you know so you're 100 percent correct right um if you're going to be a cynic you would say a couple of these organizations um so say our line of organization. So say we escalate something to BCC PAC and BCC PAC makes, makes a resolution and then it sits there and, you know, it's still active, but it could be active for like two years. So what, what actually happened to it, right? So that could be one of the frustrations is what's happening to that file, what's happening to that resolution. And then another organization that's mentioned here is the BC School Trustees Association. So trustees often have, you know, their advocacy pieces. And trustees are also looking out for the best interest of the kids. And quite often trustees will say, okay, this is really good things that we should implement. And we'll raise it up with BC Trustees Association. And if you're a cynic, you would say, well, that's where things go to die there too. Right? So that feeling is true. And, and you're, you're illustrating it of basically, how do we get a closed loop on what our advice is? And the real answer there is we have to demand it. We have to demand that closed loop. We have to ask for a closed loop. We have to provide the reasons why we deserve an answer because this matter is important and we thought about it really well. We have to have good rationale. Mm -hmm. So, I think we can be really smart about making sure we try to get a closed loop, but you're absolutely right. You know, there's a feeling out there of we give advice and nothing happens, right? And that's something that we all need to work on together to make that better. And I think that's part of, at least in in my opinion, the role of DPAC and the role of BCC PAC uh, to, to back each other up. So, you know, if you're having difficult if a pack is having difficulties closing that loop or having communication issues then we can work together to try and and rectify that um but yeah it's you know it is giving advice it's unfortunately we don't they don't always do what we want them to do <laughs> I, I will say one thing again about the the and this is probably a little unique to vancouver and the reason why it was implemented is interesting. So we have in Vancouver's Vancouver DPAC, we have what we call the PAC led motion. So this is where 10% of the PAC, so 10 or 11 PACs, bring forward a motion to DPAC where all the other PACs vote on it. And this has only happened twice in our history. And once was for a pack led motion on transparent planning. So we want to know, you know, transparently what our school facility plan is. You know, there's 18 schools that have no plan to ever be made seismically safe. Lots of those schools are mentioned to be on a secret closure list for closure or consolidation and then land disposition. So we don't like that. So we said, okay, well, show us the transparent plan. And we want that transparent plan to also be based on where kids live and will live. And we wanna see that transparency of what the city says in terms of where 
the density is coming and where the school spaces will match and be aligned to that. So that's kind of the first pack led motion that was passed. And that has strength. Another pack led motion that we passed was on music. So that was on the DPAC extracurricular choral music program. And that has weight. So pack led motions do have weight. And that's something that PACs can definitely consider for issues that affect multiple PACs. The mechanism here is to make sure that there's never a rogue DPAC. So imagine if your DPAC leaders didn't jive with the PAC leadership or the PAC thinking. So then this PAC led motion was actually invented so that PACs could reassert control over a rogue DPAC. But we're using this tool of the pack led motion differently. We're using it as a tool to empower the decision making and make those decisions have more weight because they've been voted on by all the packs. So that's kind of where we see, you know, a little more emphasis on um, making sure that the rationale is so solid and that the ask is so reasonable that there has to be a feedback loop because it's so well thought out. That's the thinking. Um, the next infographic that Amanda Hillis made, and this one, you know, this one requires a lot of, uh, 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 it's amazing to see this because this is not produced by the VSB. But this provides- not prepared parents. by the VSB. <laughs> <laughs> Not prepared by the VSP, but this, this provides a bit of a, a who's who and who is responsible for things. Um, and this is important because when things get escalated from the PAC level, um, who else then is involved? And usually that's what we call the directors of instruction. So the principal and then the next level is the directors of instruction. So from a PAC level, these names here um, for, you know, uh, we have the families of schools where you have like Britannia, Bing, King George, Kitsilano, Templeton, University Hill. And um, so that, that area there is elementary is Shannon Burton is the director of instruction for elementary and Rick Lopez is for secondary. So those would be the escalation points for the principal. So that's kind of important to know for PACs as a, as a takeaway. And I think we're looking at uh, doing some kind of information sharing regarding how to advocate. Um, we've talked about that, I believe, yes. Um, about, because I know that we've had PACs or individuals come to us trying to figure out, you know, okay, I'm not finding the resolution I want from my principal. Where do I go from here? So, um, yeah. So, uh, yeah. So, it, it, you know, on, on that one, um, we had asked uh, BCC PAC um, to do a presentation on that last year or the year before. So I, I think... I, <laughs> A, a dedicated session just on that topic would be really good. It would. Yeah. Yeah, so let, let, let's um, uh, ask BCC PAC again for that resource because they're good at that. Sounds good. So, you know, I'm sure we're gonna be referencing this uh, school district org chart uh, a lot, but the key takeaway for uh, school PACs is to know your directors of instruction. That is your escalation point. And then for also for school PACs, important to also know um, how the um, learning and instruction works, right? So the director of learning services is also kind of very important uh, for special needs and for uh, neurodiverse students. Uh, is, is it all in that bucket over there? Great, final thank you to Amanda. Amanda, you have the last word on these amazing infographics. Would you like to say something? 
Um, I did put them into the comments. So if anybody wants to download them, you totally are welcome to. And reach out to me if you have any questions and stuff. I know it's a lot to take in at first. So I am happy to be a, a resource and stuff. Um, I didn't say earlier, but I am now a director with BCC PAC and I was formerly on DPAC. Thanks, Amanda. Okay, um, so about DPAC, uh, we have a few slides about DPAC. Kanta, I think we can go through this very fast. Um, I agree. I will roll through a couple of slides and you can do the talking. Sounds good. Um, yeah, so DPAC, uh, our bylaws list their three main purposes. Um, to officially represent the parents of the school district at the district level, um, to build strong communication between parents, PACs, you have to go back one, I can't read all that, parents, yeah. PACs, and the Vancouver School Board, and to promote and support parent leadership and effective PAC governance. In summary, we are basically there to support you. So if you have questions, if you have um, a moment of what do I do next, or who do I talk to, you talk to us and we are always happy to provide an answer, provide guidance. And if we don't know the answer, we will find it out. Um, we also, and I know this is gonna be mentioned later on, but I'm gonna say it now. Uh, we also have a Slack group called pack to pack um, If you're not part of that Slack group, please let me know, reach out, and I would love to connect you to it. Um, it's a really great community where people post questions or concerns or thoughts. Um, DPAC uh, responds as well as uh, other PAC uh, execs. Um, and we put opportunities that we hear about there. So um, there's all kinds of resource and information sharing there that I think really makes us the community or is part of what makes us the community that we are. Um, yeah, and there's three levels of representation representation with deep within the pack. Um, there is the exec, and there's pack reps, and then also parents. Um, and we welcome uh, all the parents to join us at meetings. Um, the exec meetings are for voting for the execs. And if I get anything wrong, Vic is going to step in and tell me because I'm new to the execs. So I am learning as we go too. Um, and then the DPAC reps can vote at the general meetings. Mm -hmm. And then the parents, um, when I wasn't actually on PAC, I really enjoyed attending DPAC meetings just because you find out what's happening at other schools. It gives you a, a wider focus of what's happening within the district. And uh, you know, that's, it's really fascinating to find out um, how school, other schools handle different issues or what they're dealing with. Perfect. Um, so yeah, you just recapped our meetings. That's great. Um, so we, we do have some, you know, ad hoc meetings now and then too. And, and those ones are, you know, um, very interesting and very good in the sense that they're on special interest. Um, what we wanna do is we wanna have some meetings on like course planning. Um, so there may be a special meeting just for course planning. We had special meetings on the long range facilities plan. We had special meetings on the MAC program. So there's special meetings that come up on certain issues. If like slows are gonna be reintroduced, I'm sure there'll be a special meeting on slows so that we can gather feedback from everybody. And then I'll re-emphasize what uh, Kanta said about pack to pack Slack. If you're not on pack to pack Slack, put a message in the chat right now. We need to get you on it. Lots and lots of information goes to the pack to pack for packs to give us advice. So before we give advice to the district, we almost always posted in pack to pack Slack saying, we're about to say this, here's what our plan is, here's our rationale, what do you think? Can you help us improve it? And then we do get more questions and we do get improvements. So then what we go to, to the district with is even better thought than what we could have done by ourselves. Um, we're a stakeholder. 
So we're one of the stakeholders. The VSB has many stakeholders. The other ones would be all the unions um, and the, the principals association and the teachers association. So those are the, the union side of the stakeholders and the, we're the parent union. We're the parent, not union, but we're the, the parent rep. Um, and we're the only one that is, I guess we're the only one that is pure volunteer and not um, not affiliated or paid by, you know, employed by or paid by the VSB. So we're the only one that, I guess, closer to what you would have as a general public, you know, input. And then we talked a lot about building community um, and I would love to, I think I even forgot some of the uh, working groups and committees that we have on here. <laughs> Maddie, go ahead. Hi, can you back up one slide? I just have a question. What, what does it, the, yeah. What, what, what's a VSB standing committee or ad hoc committee? Great question. So the, the VSB has standing committees on facilities, on personnel, on finance, on student well-being and learning, and um, one more on policy and governance. So five standing committees that have like regular, usually anywhere from four to six um, meetings in a year. So these are standing committees that we have a rep on. So I rep the facilities committee, um, Kayenta reps the student learning and well-being committee, right? Um, Sky Richards represent, reps the finance committee. So each one of us and the DPAC basically will take on one committee work. And then there's ad hoc committees. So an ad hoc committee could be around music, it could be around food, and then we have a usually it's not a DPAC executive member. Usually it's a parent or a PAC leader that usually will then volunteer to be on one of the ad hoc committees. So an example there is like Selena would be on our food, um, the VSB ad hoc committee for food. So that, that's the structure of standing committees versus ad hoc committees. Thanks. That sounds like an awesome amount of uh, participation. I didn't realize we had that. That's great. Yeah. Um, yeah. So building community. So this is the the key emphasis is spread the word. There's lots and lots of committees, lots and lots of great ways for your parents to be involved in DPAC on a specialty version that's meaningful, but that's only limited to minimal time, maximum return for their special interest. And that's what these committees and working groups are all about. And then they're to help all the PACs provide resources too. So it's, a, it's an ecosystem cycle that we want to create here. Great. Um, any last words on DPAC? Are we good there? I think so. Yep. Sorry, I've been messaging people links to the pack to pack Slack. Thank okay. you for your interest. That's awesome. Great. And we have Amanda Hillis here from BCC Pack. Um, um, but I don't, I'm not going to put you on the spot, Amanda. I'm going to go through this with Kanta a little bit. So we'll do it. Um, so Kanta, what about BCC Pack? Well, there is this thing called. No, <laughs> um, uh, so BCC PAC is one level above DPAC and is the umbrella organization that represents all of the provincial DPACs to uh, the Ministry of Education. And Amanda, you're going to jump in if I've got this wrong, I really hope. Um, and so they are uh, an opportunity to collectively represent the parents of BC. Um, and they have the opportunity to sit down with the de de decision makers at the provincial level. 
Um, they also provide uh, education opportunities and they have uh, different learning opportunities during the year. There's the Deep Back um, event coming on. The Deep Back Summit. Please, please save me. <laughs> summit, summit, yeah, yeah. Thank you, Summit. <laughs> coming up in November that we ha um, are um, registered for. So, um, yeah, I think that covers it fairly well. Great. Nora, you got a hand up? Oh, great. Hi, Nora, go ahead. No? Okay, yeah, Nora. Like later, Nora. Okay, I see Nora's hand up. Um, yeah, so BCC PAC is also a, a volunteer. Um, so it's it's also the, the closest thing to the general public constantly advising um, the Ministry of Education. We're a member of BCC PAC. They charge a very nominal amount of $150 uh, for D packs and seventy five dollars for packs, and um, oh, go ahead, Nora. Nora, are you back? Yeah, I'm back. I'm back. Okay. I'm just talking my phone. Um, I had a question for Amanda because I just wanted to know uh, during the year and also for the conference, are they going to have a section on anti racism and you know IDEA and because it's an important issue, right? So. I'm curious as to how the BCC pack, like, do they have a position on it? Have they done anything about it? Hi, Nora. Um, they haven't finalized all of the DPAC, the summit schedules yet. I mean, day one, we will be having a lot of ministry presentations on the Friday, and the Saturday is more of the discussions with the DPACs going over issues. And I haven't seen the finalized schedule yet, but that is a common one that we are on. Um, we talk about the inclusion and the diverse groups um, at a lot of our meeting. We are members on the SOGI committee and a whole bunch of the other provincial level groups that we interact. I'm not the member on that committee itself, but I was on the Thessal one, so I went to that meeting last week, but um, there it is a uh, top of mind and it is definitely something that we're continuing to work on. Nora, I muted you because you have some background noise, but do you want to have a follow up? If you do, you can just chime in and come back. Sorry for muting you, just so some background noise. Um, so yeah, so I was at the $75 a year for PACs. We do recommend that you do join BCC PAC. Mm -hmm. um, and that way you do get access to the uh, events and you get to vote and you get to make resolutions. Um, no matter what the value of resolutions, they're important because there's just documentation. So regardless of what happens, it's important to document things and to have that documented. And then BCCPAC is the authority and the resource for um, individual parents who need to advocate for their child. Everyone is there to support, but we actually have to really adhere to what BCCPAC's guidance is because it's the right one. It basically has the right philosophy of making sure that everything is, you know, kind of well documented. So if you have a relationship with um, your principal and, you know, you're talking about your child and your principal says some things to you, what you should do is write back to your principal and say, here's what I heard. And I just want to make sure that this is what I heard and then we can move forward based on what our understanding is. So just simple things like that really help a lot. And that's what we'll end up doing another session with BCC back on, on how to be a great advocate. And with that, we do need to update this. So Nora, this slide, you still have access to it. Please put in your input into here. So we have your input documented for eternity. 
Um, and of course, Amanda, I will update um, your slides and I'll put our input in here, Kayenta, so that we have this documented. And with that, we look forward to PAC 201 mm -hmm. in the future. And I'm going to stop sharing. And for 12 minutes, we'll just open it up to general conversation. And I think for this part, we can turn off the recording. Yes. Thank you.